and that's that. So there's there are some passages where the term is going to um, come from. Revelation 19, we see someone is who's referred to here as a a, a marriage getting ready to take place. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. We read, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So we see this wife that's making herself ready. Let's go to Revelation chapter 21. In chapter 21, we read in verse 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So we see that terminology there. One place it's, it's referred to as a wife. Another time it's referred to here as a bride. Um, and so while we don't see the actual phrase, the bride of Christ, certainly there's somebody that, that Christ is marrying here in Revelation. So that's what we're talking about is this question of who is this bride being referred to in Scripture? Who is, who is this bride of Christ? Now, rarely is it going to be argued that the lamb who's, who's being married here, um, when, when we, look, we see that both in chapter 19 and verse 21, what we want to establish really right out of the gate is the lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, there's not going to be too much disagreement with the fact that in this marriage that the lamb is Christ. John the Baptist, of course, calls him um, the lamb which taketh away the sin of the world. In Acts, Luke writes that he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. In um, Peter, he calls him a lamb without blemish and without spot. And Paul in 1 Corinthians writes, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So again, we see Christ being referred to as the lamb. There's no question that he's the lamb in, this, um, in, this, in these passages. But what we're, what we're looking at here is this issue of the bride and who this bride is. Now, as um, Richard had just mentioned, they're, they're really the, the vast majority of Christendom out there is going to come to the conclusion that the bride of Christ is the New Testament church. So if you're a Catholic, then you say that it's the Catholic church. If you're a Protestant, then you're going to just say that it's, depending on how much you know, you might just say that it's the New Testament church. You might say that it's the body of Christ. Again, depending on how much, how much information you have. But that's going to be the vast majority um, out there. Now, the much small, and this, this actually includes quite a few dispensationalists that have come to this conclusion that the church is the bride. And then the, the, the smaller minority conclusion is the fact that, that Israel is the bride of Christ. Now, what we want to show here, again, right, right out of the beginning here, is that the body is not the bride of Christ. And we're going we're gonna to address some issues of, of why that's the case but what I want to focus on more is the issue of why Israel is the bride of Christ. Now, when we, when we see that, then again, that basically is going to take care of the, the issue of whether or not the body is the Christ or the body is the bride. But that being said, what I want to clarify is that to say that Israel is the bride of Christ doesn't really give a full explanation of it. I think it actually sells it a little bit short. So just to, just to have a quick answer and say that Israel is the bride, that's true. It's a correct answer. But there's more to it than to say that just Israel is the bride of Christ. There's a little bit more to it. And then the other thing, and again, we're not going to spend too much time on this, is while Israel is in fact the bride of Christ, the body is married to Christ. So again, we want to repeat that. Somebody, um, I, think, I think it was Tom mentioned that the other night, is that, that the body is married to Christ. So Paul's actually going to use terminology 
that, that goes along with that. So, and that's an important issue. So just, just the fact that Israel is the bride of Christ does not mean that you're not married to Christ. And we're going to see what that means as we kind of go through this. Now, as I had mentioned, quite a few even early dispensationalists had come to a, a different conclusion. Now, what, what we want to understand here to kind of to clarify this is that there are a couple of relationships that we need to understand in Scripture that is, are going to greatly help the conclusion that we're going to come to. So there are, there are three groups, if you could say that, or, or three parties that are involved that we're talking about here. One is Christ, the Messiah. One is the nation of Israel. And one is the, the country or the land that they're going to inherit, so the, the piece of real estate. All three of these things are going to be connected to each other. So again, when we just say that Israel is the bride, there's a little bit more to it, I think, than that. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at these specific relationships. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Now the first relationship of these, these three that I want to focus on here in Genesis chapter 12, what we see here, of course, is the Abrahamic covenant. So we're all familiar with the Abrahamic covenant. And what's going on with the Abrahamic covenant is God is promising Abraham's seed a piece of real estate. Very simple concept. That's it. He's just promising Abraham and his seed that you're going to possess some land and that a nation is going to come out of you. And then when we go over to verse, or I'm sorry, um, chapter 13, verse 14, chapter 13, verse 14, we read, And the Lord said unto Abraham, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. So again, this is, this is physical land that he's, that he's looking at here. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. And so, if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land, in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. So, painfully simple question, is land on the earth? Yes, land, land is on the earth. Okay, second painfully simple question. When he promises this land forever, is forever an eternal thing? Forever is eternal. So again, what we're going to see is that this land is promised to this nation of Israel and that they're going to possess this land forever. They're, going, they're quite literally going to be married to, to this piece of land forever. And we're going to see this terminology used. So let's go up to Isaiah chapter 62. Isaiah. Isaiah 62. The glue that is really bringing this marriage together, that's welding these two things together, is quite literally the Abrahamic covenant that we just, that we just read. So the Abrahamic covenant is, is the superglue that's going to bring this relationship together. Isaiah chapter 62, and this, this promise is going to be confirmed throughout Scripture. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 4, we read, Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. So again, we see this, this being confirmed that the land is going to be married. The very word Beulah means married. That's what, the word, that's what the word means. I think in the old North Shore Church, or maybe, maybe earlier on Shore, there was actually a woman named Beulah. 
So it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of an unusual name. She was, um, one, I think, the organist or something like that, Beulah. And, um, but that word Beulah means married, that they're going to be married to this land. So sometimes we hear Christians will, will talk, especially when we're getting into these issues, political issues of whether, the, whether gays can get married today and whatnot. So a Christian stands up and says, well, the Bible defines marriage between a man and a woman. There it's actually not true. There the Bible's actually defining marriage between a nation and their land. And we use that term married like that all the time. So it's not something that we need to get caught up in. So somebody might say, um, oh, I just got a new job. How do you like it? Well, I'm not married to it. But we know what they mean by that. They're not, they're not connected to it. They're not, they're, not, they're not married to that thing. So the Bible uses the term like that, that, that there's a connection. So the Bible, again, does not necessarily define... Now, I'm not, I'm not defending the former, but I, 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 wanna, I, I just want to get that out of the way. Now, so when we're talking about marriage, what we're talking about is to be united in a close and permanent relationship, to be combined, to be joined, to be brought together, to be made one. So again, here, here they are, they're being married to the land. And then we, we see this confirmed. Later on we read, Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth. Again, so we see this physical land, this earth being confirmed. In Revelation we read, And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. They shall reign forever and ever on the earth. So again, this, is, this stuff is confirmed throughout Scripture. So Israel will be married to the land. Now, there's another relationship. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. That is 2 Samuel chapter 7. Just as real. Just as permanent. Just as binding. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now we had read about the Abrahamic covenant. Now we're reading about the Davidic covenant. 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel 7 verse 10. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people, Israel, and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them anymore as before time. And as since the, that, the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, and the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house, and when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, here, here's the covenant, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish or establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So again, painfully simple question, is forever eternal? Is eternal forever? Yes. They're, they're, they're one and the same. So what we're going to see here is this promised Christ Messiah is now going to be joined to this nation forever. He's going to be married to them. He's not going to depart from them. It's going, it, it is an eternal covenant that's being made there that he is going to Again, this throne is going to be established. Now, it hasn't identified who the Christ is yet. That's just the title. But the Christ will be married to the nation eternally. Now, of course, when we get into the New Testament, we see who that, who that Christ is. He's got a name, the Lord Jesus Christ. So it identifies who the guy is. But again, that he's going to be eternally wed, as it were, to the nation. His throne is going to be an eternal throne. Now let's go to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Now this will really throw a monkey wrench in, in things a little bit. Is This is actually not their first wedding. This is, a, this is a, a... Sometimes you hear about a couple that they're married and then they get divorced and then they get remarried. That's actually what's going on here. So Jehovah was married to the nation. He divorced them. And they're going to get remarried. So we're literally talking about a second marriage, really, or a, a remarriage, if you will. 
in, so now we're in Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3, we read in verse 8. And I saw, verse 8, and I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. So Jehovah, quite literally, he, he ends up divorcing Israel. Verse 20, Surely as a wife treacherously departed from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. Now, let's go back. We're in Jeremiah, let's go back one book to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 50. He doesn't do this just because he's tired of her and he wants to get a, a newer, younger model. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 50. We see Isaiah chapter 50, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, where is the bill of your mother's divorcement, whom I have put away? So the idea, again, is just the issue that Jehovah has had to divorce, and he was, he was forced into that situation. What happened is he had an, an adulterous wife, and built right into that law is if, if he's got this adulterous wife, that he is legally allowed to put her away for her adultery. And what she does is she's married to him, but she is an, a, a serial adulterer. So what she's doing is she's continuously going out and creating, or committing spiritual adultery is what's going on. And she's sleeping with any god that she can get her hands on, any bale that she can get her hands on. So if another god comes along, she'll worship that god. Another one comes along, she'll worship that god. Another one comes along, she'll worship that god. Until he finally gets to the point and says, we're done. Here's the, here's the bill of divorce. And the terminology that's used is very powerful to the point where she almost quite literally is likened to just a street whore, just a, a nasty, anybody again that'll come along, she'll sleep with any other god that, that will have her. And so this, this eventually comes to this point that he gives her a bill of divorcement. Now, and, and she, again, what, what she's doing, I'll just read one passage for the time's sake. We don't need to turn here. But my people ask counsel at their stocks, and their staff declareth unto them. So you see that, that terminology, their stocks and their staff. In, in, um, that's in Hosea chapter 4. And it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom. It's not even a big deal to her anymore that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. So, so she's, she's taking stones and carving them out. This stuff, same stuff's going on today. And next thing you know, she's kneeling in front of the, the stone and lighting a little candle in front of the stone, carving, carving things out of trees, worshiping those things, taking the remainder of the wood and building a little fire and warming her hands with her as she's... She's, she's taking counsel for these, these stocks, these, again, in, in stones that's going on. So, so eventually, again, he has to divorce her, but he says that he's going to, he makes this covenant that he's going to remarry her. And he is actually going to present her as a virgin. So that comes as a problem to some people. How could, well, she, how could you describe Israel as virgin? He does the same thing with us. He, pre he presents you as holy and without blame. No big deal for the God of the universe to, to, to purify her. As if she's, again, not as if, purify her as a virgin. Again, I behold, I make all things new. Wow. Again, only the God of the universe. Now, so we see again that Messiah is going to be married to this land through, again, through the the um, Davidic covenant. Now, what's going to happen, or I, actually I, I just jumped ahead with the statement I made, but um, Christ is going to be married to the nation of Israel, but the statement that I just made, again, this, the next step of this really goes without saying. So if Christ is going to be married to the nation, and the nation is going to be married to the land, then Christ has to be connected to the land, right? I mean, that just goes, that's where the, that's where the throne is. 
the throne is, is part of this thing. So we see again, and then this is going to be confirmed, that, that Messiah is also going to not separate himself from this land. Let's go to, back to Isaiah chapter 62. Isaiah chapter 62. We were just in verse 4. Let's read that again. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over thee, or over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. So again... He's involved with this marriage. And again, we're going to see that this is now going to be confirmed. Let's go up to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 9. So would it make sense that if this, if this connection in this marriage is to take place, that when the kingdom is presented, that it would be talked about? Sure. It's, he's, going to mention, he's going to mention this. This is going to be talked about when he's talking about the fact that this kingdom is going to be presented. So Matthew chapter 9, again, the lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he's, the, he's the groom. He's the, he's the bridegroom. Chapter 9, verse 15, as, And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. So the only thing that we're trying to address there or, or clarify there is that Christ is the bridegroom. No questions about it whatsoever. Again, he's referring to himself as the bridegroom. John the Baptist says, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So John the Baptist is the best man. The bridegroom is the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, there's, there's no question about that. So he's going to talk about this marriage. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. So Matthew chapter 22, he's, he's writing about this in a parable. Verse 1, we read, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables. And he said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and my fatlings are killed. All things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. The wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment. And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we read about this, this wedding being referred to. Now, when we go back to the beginning of the parable there, at the beginning of chapter 22, we see that it is, Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. So the first thing you want to establish is this is a royal wedding. 
He's not just some guy, plumber's son or something like that. This is a royal wedding, the royal wedding that we're reading about here. Again, this is, this is, a, this is a very important aspect to it. Now, when we look at this thing in verse 2, we read, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. So again, the comparison there is that the kingdom of heaven is like unto this marriage. So again, what, it, what is likened to the marriage? The kingdom of heaven is like unto a marriage. So it makes it crystal clear. Now when I have a king sitting on a throne and I have a nation made up of people and they're in a certain piece of real estate, a country, land, what did I just describe? That's the kingdom of heaven right there. That's, that's, that is the kingdom of heaven that, just, that was just described there. So again, when we use that terminology and we say, well, he's marrying Israel, yes, he's marrying Israel, but there's a little bit more to it. He's marrying the kingdom is who he's marrying. He's not going to separate from it. He's not going to join this kingdom and then a million years down the road just divorce her again. He's, gonna, he's going to be married to this kingdom. So again, it's, it's, it's not a surprise that he would use this kind of, this kind of terminology in um, the four Gospels. Now, let's go... Well, we're not going to turn back here, but when, again, when we're in Revelation 19 and we're in Revelation 21, we see a marriage occurring. So again, it's going to fit like a glove to what has now been described throughout Scripture, that this thing is going to occur. So now all of a sudden, all, all, all we see is the fact that this thing is happening. So, so what, who was likened unto the marriage? The kingdom of heaven is likened unto the marriage. Who's the groom in the situation? The groom is the lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's the bride? He's marrying the kingdom. Again, so there's, there's a, all of this stuff relates to each other. Now, let's go, we're in Matthew, let's go back to chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, and we're going to see why Revelation uses the terminology that it does. So it doesn't just use random words. It uses those specific words for a reason. Matthew chapter 20, we read in verse 18, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. Now notice you go up to Jerusalem. You never go down to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. You never go down to meet the Lord. You're always going up. You always go up if you're going to, again, meet the Lord. Now, behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. Now, did you ever wonder, why, why are they going to Jerusalem? I mean, why not Boston? Why not, why not Madrid? Why not the city of Dan? Why not Samaria? Why not some other city? He's going to Jerusalem. That is, right, that number one, that she said that's the city of God. That's, that's God's city. That's the city that he chose. But Jerusalem is the headquarters of this, of the kingdom. That's the capital city. So if you're going to do business in, in, the, in the nation, you go to the capital. So if somebody's got some important business to, to deal with, they go to Washington. So if I make a, a phrase, or if I make a statement say, well... Washington is in gridlock right now. What do I mean by that? Do I mean that the traffic is... No, I mean, I'm referring to the government, obviously. That just almost goes without saying. So I say, Washington is going to be in talks with Moscow next week. Do you think the two cities just want to gather together? No, it's who they represent. It's the, it's the two nations that they're representing. So when we read about Jerusalem in the Scriptures... Frequently, the word just really is, is a replacement for the government or the nation as a whole. So it's, just, it's, a, it's a representative word just saying that the powers that be, so to speak, over the nation. So again, this is the king going into the capital city, and there's an importance there. Now, again, as we had just said, the throne of David is going to be in Jerusalem. Now, when we get to... And we're not going to turn here just yet, but when we get into Revelation, would it be appropriate that Scripture would refer to this city? Sure. 
because of what the city represents. It's not just some random city, just some beautiful city. It, it represents everything that the kingdom stands for. So when it talks about, uh, it talks about a new Jerusalem, it means this is the new system. This is the new governmental system over the universe. So it, again, there's a, there's a very important connection there. So when we look at this land, it's the capital of Beulah land, of the promised land. That's where the son of David lives. And, and the nation, it's not just a city with no people in it. There's people that inhabit the nation. That's where the son of Abraham lives. That's where the son of God is going to reign over the universe. And he's also the last Adam. Accomplishing what Adam was set out to do that never was able to accomplish. So again, this, is, this new Jerusalem thing is going to be command central of the universe. So it's important that that terminology would be used. So let's go back to Revelation now. Revelation chapter 21. So I can say that the bride of Christ is the new Jerusalem. If I had a question on a grade school to Bible test and I answered that, he may mark it right. Okay. It's the new Jerusalem, because that's what the verses say. But again, it's, there's more to it than just that. It's what this city is going to represent. Revelation chapter 21, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I saw, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride for her husband down to verse 9, and there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, come hither, I'll show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, there's the kingdom, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of God, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. So we see this city now being referred to. Now, if, if for time's sake, we don't, we don't have a lot of time to go through these verses, but as you read down through chapter 21, it's very specific about this city. Details, materials, dimensions. Very, very specific things about this city. We haven't really seen something described as being this specific since really probably the building of the temple and the tabernacle, very specific materials. You can't just throw anything up on the wall. It's got to be built God's way. Again, so we're going to see something very similar that almost parallels this. Again, they're very specific details, and you can read through that sometime and just enjoy some of these, some of these details. So as we're, as we're going down, and we're in chapter 21, and we read, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just pick out, again, for time's sake, some of, some of these specific details that there's a wall, great and high. And, it, and it's got 12 gates, and the 12 gates, um, and the gates, 12 angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So again, as we're, as we're reading down through this, we're going to see this terminology used repetitively. So we see the word, the, the word city down in verse 14, and the, the wall of the city, verse 16, and the city. Again, verse, verse 16 again, the city. Verse 18, the city. Verse 19, the city. Verse 21, the city. Verse 23, the city. Verse 14 in chapter 22, the city. So why would God the Holy Spirit go to such great lengths to describe this city? Again, because it's what the city represents. It's everything that this city stands for. And, and what he's showing us here is this is not going to be just some little hokey-pokey city. This isn't like just getting in your car and driving to Toledo or Erie, Pennsylvania or Ashtabula or something like that. This is a magnificent city. Mind-blowing city. So the, what he's trying to show here is that this is God's 
city. This is God's government. This is what it looks like when God is in charge. It looks different than our cities. There is no crime zone in this city. Again, this is a magnificent city. We have a thing in downtown Chicago. It's called the Merchandise Mart. It's a huge building, and it's, and it's just what it sounds like, merchandise. You go in there, and they have, they have tiles and fabrics and colors and all the newest, coolest things, whether it's a chair or a table, things. Restaurants can go in there and buy things. You can buy things for your house. Probably none of us in this room have enough money to buy some of the stuff that they have in there, maybe. And, but there, it's just cool, cool stuff. So if you like that kind of stuff, you see just the cutting edge stuff. God actually does this here in Revelation, and he's showing some of, this, some of this material. So the stuff that man comes up with is not even in the same universe. So this is the kind of city where you just walk through the entire city, just jaw drop. He built it and says, check this out. This is where I'm going to live, and you can live in it with me. Okay, not the body. But he, but he, but he invites saints to live in it with him. Again, now, and we, and we see this, this bride being described. Now, this is a city, the most spectacular thing about the city, needless to say, is the fact that God lives there. That's, that's what makes the thing so spectacular. That's, that's the best aspect of the entire city. So when we read down through this passage, we read about 12 gates, 12 angels, 12 tribes, 12 foundations, 12 apostles, 12 pearls. What's Israel's number? How many times do you think that the word city is used in that passage? Wild guess. 12. How many times do you think the word church is used in that passage? Zero. There's no references to the church, the body of Christ in this passage. When we read down through this thing, this is Israel's city. Now, we're the, we're the, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 10. I think we're going to have enough time for this. 1 Kings, hold your place in Revelation, and then go to 1 Kings chapter 10. 1 Kings chapter 10. Now, we read about gates and walls of this city. So this is a city that's going into eternity. So we wonder, why are there walls? Why are there gates of this city? Usually when you have gates, it's you're keeping people out. So there's some reason why there would even be gates to begin with and, and what's going on here. This goes back to this Abrahamic covenant. All the nations are going to be blessed out of this city. So these blessings are just going to pour out of this city where, where righteousness is going to just emanate from this. Now we see this image of this. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 1. And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, this is an image, just a little foreshadow, a little foretaste of what's going to happen. And when the queen of Sheba heard the, the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. And she came, and here it is, she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. That's an image of these Gentiles just coming in, bearing gifts. 24-7 continuously, just bringing in, bringing in their riches. Israel is going to suck the milk of the Gentiles. They're going to just, again, just continuously bring in their blessings into this city. Let's go back to Revelation. So as we see that terminology used, it's not a shock that now we're going to see this just confirmed, the fact that this, is, in fact, is going to happen. Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Again, spectacular city. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night thereof. 
and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations, so there's nations, into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Could you say that about Chicago? (laughs) So again, this is a city of righteousness. And we just see these Gentiles just bringing in and bearing these gifts and these blessings just pouring out according to these covenants. Now... We see that terminology again confirmed throughout the Old Testament that Israel is going to, in fact, inherit the Gentiles. So there's there's blessings that go specifically to, and again, I want to read a couple of these just just quick. We don't have time to go to them, but um, Isaiah chapter 61, But ye shall be named the priest of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. That's Isaiah chapter 61. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream, just pouring through those gates. So we're seeing that, again, fitting like a glove when we get into Revelation. Now, if the church, the body of Christ, or if the church, the body of Christ, was the bride of Christ, where on earth in Scripture do we read the body of Christ inheriting the Gentiles? Where do we read about the church sucking the milk of the Gentiles? We are the Gentiles. So again, there's, 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 there, there, there's, no, there's no verses that are going to match that. So, we're, we're, again, we're looking through this and we're confirming that this, this city, there's no question whatsoever that this is Israel's city. Now, somebody, I just heard this statement, and I, I, it was a wonderful statement, so I want to repeat it, is... This bride and this marriage would occur had the body of Christ never been created. Had the body of Christ never been created, this marriage was still going to occur. This is Israel's marriage. These are their blessings. So we're in a hotel. I want to imagine for a second that there is a wedding going on in the room next door. And we all said, hey, let's, I think it would be funny if we go over there and eat their food and jump in on this wedding and dance and get some drinks. What do you say, you in? <laughs> Just think of the audacity to do something like that, you know. Okay, now think about actually going into that church and celebrating in that marriage and trying to participate as that poor bride is up there and saying, move over, I want to take her place. That's spiritual larceny <laughs> is what that is. That's, that's us taking something that is not ours. Now, this, this wedding, it's holy, it's sacred, it's theirs, it belongs to Israel. So again, we don't want to try to take something from, from scriptures that doesn't belong to us to begin with. Now, what happens is when you get into Paul's epistles, you read some, some verses where some marriage terminology is used. Paul would never called the church the bride of Christ, but he's going to use comparisons and, and likenesses repetitively, so sometimes that might get some people to kind of scratch their heads. So we read, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul uses that terminology that you're espoused, you're married to Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, we see those comparisons. So someone says, wait a minute, that's got to be the body. Paul's allowed to use that terminology. So what I said at the beginning here is that while, while this belongs to Israel, no questions about it. This is Israel's. You are, in fact, married to Christ. It's a different marriage. God has the, the legal right to marry who he wants to marry, and he's allowed to define marriage the way he wants to define it. He's the, he's the, he's the author of this book, and he's the author of the concept of marriage to begin with. So as an illustration, what I'd like you to do here is stay in your seats. So don't, don't get up. Stay in your seat. But what, what I'd like you to do is, is um, go out to the front room and gather outside of the building right now. But, but stay here. Hard to do, right? I don't know about you, but I'm married to my body. I have never gone anywhere without it that I recall. 
for good or bad, whatever it is. I, I, don't, I don't remember ever having a day where I went somewhere without my body. I'm married to it. I'm connected to it. So again, somebody made this reference the other day, and it's a beautiful comparison. The moment you got saved, you got joined and placed into that one new man, the church, the body of Christ. You're married to him. You are never getting out of that one new man. Praise God. You are, you are, you are connected to him eternally. There will also be a marriage ceremony of sorts that will occur at the rapture where all of the church, the body of Christ, will be for the first time gathered together in one place with the head and the body together. That marriage ceremony is every bit as sacred and as holy and as special and as beautiful as this one here. They're not the same. They're not the same. So again, this is Israel's. We need to let it be Israel's, and we need to not take something, again, that does not belong to us. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So I, again, and I encourage you to do this. Go back into Revelation and read about this city. Just, again, mind-blowingly beautiful place. Don't ever for a second think, well, we, we're second-class citizens and we don't get to participate in this. This is God's city. We don't get to participate in this and, and therefore we're the red-headed stepchild that just gets some little <laughs> leftover blessings in these things. First Corinthians chapter 2, and we're familiar with these passages. But as it is written, verse 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, but as it is written, I have not seen by the way, did John see this city? Okay. Paul could never make that statement that I have not seen. As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. He's got some glories that are just as good. Again, this is, this is his city, and what this represents is the fact that the God of creation is in charge. What a beautiful, wonderful, wonderful day this is going to be when this occurs. Lord God, thank you for the time to gather here together. We thank you for this group. Um, we thank you for your book. We thank you for the promises that you've given us to it, and it's in our wonderful Savior's name. Amen. Now, I've got I to give a 20-second commercial real quick.